So the other day I got this crazy shock, uh, perhaps one of the biggest shocks in my life. And I was thinking back to a house party I had been to and these sisters were talking about how a man wouldn't even be dateable if he didn't make at least five, which is crazy, but that's not even the shock part. The shock part was me thinking back to when I was growing up and how men would have children and a woman and they get a little hoopty or whatever job they could. They may or may not finish junior high, may or may not finish high school, but they would do whatever they could to take care of their families. And they wasn't even in the trajectory of getting anywhere near five. Then I started thinking, if you looked at my whole street, right, take one block and one side of the street, you wouldn't come up with five if you added everybody together. And and it's possible that you could add both sides of the block and not get to that. Then I'm thinking, and this is almost where the shock part comes. I'm thinking about this family that owned a club restaurant called the Peppermint Lounge, soul food restaurant, famous club since the 70s. All these big uh, artists, you know, the Philadelphia Sound, all that stuff. Uh, at some point, Eddie Murphy, Whitney Houston, you got limos, you got the family parking Rolls Royces in the parking lot all the time. It was glamorous to us. And I'm thinking, man, you know, they, I'm sure they had though. But this is where the shot comes in. I was trying to get more information about that family, uh, which was uh, Ernest Howard, Ernie Howard, right? The street is named after him now. The place is, is long, long gone, so it's sad. That whole place is rubble, right? There was another family called the Stewart's that had a soul food restaurant, Mrs. Stewart's, around Lyons Avenue in the Weekway section in Newark. And then, you know, she had a whole block, right? So she owned a lot of property, uh, laundry mats, and so on. And I remember there was a link between them. So that's what I was looking up when I got my little shop. I remember like all the money that people were making, like how even the guy in the mechanic shop was running numbers and taking bets for games and lending people money. I mean, it was a lot going on for people who had it, but the most of us ain't have it. So we wasn't never going to get to that. So then I come across an article about a brother who runs a club and he uh, murders his son, according to the article, his wife and himself. He commits suicide. And the article is about this brother named Ruben. Now, the significance and why this is a shock, this is the shock, is Ruben was the person who owned the venue, which is Bogies, right? His father owned most of that block. He sold off that property a little by little, but he kept that club. He kept the club uh, for one reason, to make sure his son always had that. And his son managed it in mid to late 90s, beginning that spoken word in New Jersey. My boy Danny Lynn was the promoter, but that whole New Jersey vibe. So the, the people would come up from Philly, like Black Ice, Lamar Manson, the Twin Poets, the names from New York that would come over, Stacey Ann Chen, Lynn Proko, Roger, you know, Bonaire. And then in 1999, we became uh, the New Yorican National Slam Team. So the whole New York Slam Team, the New Yorican Slam Team came out of bogeys, all four positions. It was Kurt. Faraji, Lamar Hill, and myself. And just to give you the magnitude of it, I mean, bogeys was that thing. Like, you get on stage, you had to have your deal down. If you messed up, it wasn't one of them spots where they were snapping their fingers, talking about you could just, you know, keep going. Like, if you messed up, they tell you to get off the stage. Make no bones about it. And he provided that spot, right? So we kind of looked up to him in a sense because he had the cars, he had the house, he had the, the wherewithal, he had a father who was supportive in his life. And my condolences to the family because, of course, I don't know the circumstances of that situation, but it just blows my mind because it took me back to thinking about these sisters that were talking about how much you need to have. But money doesn't equate to happiness. It never has. Bob Marley was asked, is he rich? He said, what kind of riches are you talking about? Are you talking about material possessions? I don't have those type of riches. My riches is life forever. And that's where I'm at. I don't look for that in a person and I would hope that no one would ever look for that in me. Not riches, not material riches. I am of the opinion, like so many other people, that if you find more ways to really love life, and I'm not talking about materials, if you find ways to really love life, to give back to people who used to give to you, think back to people who did things for you, call them up, see what they need. Maybe you're in a position to help them now, or you can donate or, or volunteer time and, and give back to yourself, right? To, to sow into yourself, to exercise, to read, to think, spend some time, you know, walking. The more ways you find to love life, the more ways life is going to have to find to love you, right? Back.